Hello and welcome to Fire of Learning. I'm Justin. Why did you get the name that you did? Perhaps you were named after a relative, like a parent or grandparent, or after a religious, mythical, or historical figure, after a place or a character trait, or most likely, your parents just liked the way your name sounded and the image it evoked. Regardless, names are very interesting things, and there may be more to yours than you realize. It's interesting that names do evoke images in our minds. These images are determined not only by the average of the people we personally have met with that name, but how our society views certain names. Some names have stereotypical character traits attached to them. Among young people, a Karen refers to a middle-aged soccer mom type who yells at cashiers. A Chad refers to a young, successful, attractive alpha male type. And the Kyle refers to an erratic, heavily caffeinated teenager with issues managing impulses and anger. Of course, not everyone with these names behaves like this, but where do people get these stereotypes then? Furthermore, how do the names that our society gives, and the trends which these names follow, reflect on the people within it? In recent decades, names have been diversifying quite a bit. What does this trend represent about our society? Well, in this video, we'll answer all this and more, so let's get to it. Before we begin, I would like to thank Datboy, Pulsar7373, Miguel Joseph Jr., and John Ballard for being our most recent supporters on Patreon. They join the supporters who make these videos possible. According to Laura Wattenberg, author of the book The Baby Name Wizard, names have been diversifying quite a bit in countries like the United States in recent decades. In 1950, about 25 given boy names and 50 girl names accounted for half of the given names in the United States. Today, to represent about half of all Americans, you would need to take about 134 boy names and 320 girl names. From this statistic, we can conclude two main points. A, that women have more diversity of names than men, and B, that names are increasingly diversifying. As for the first one, indeed, according to the Social Security Administration, there are about 19,000 unique names for girls and 14,000 unique names for boys recorded in the US. Why exactly this is the case isn't clear, but a number of factors no doubt contribute, such as the fact that women are much more likely to adopt traditionally male names like Cameron, Leslie, Kelly, and Jordan than vice versa. But why are names diversifying? Well, again, there are likely a number of factors at play here. Immigration is one. People from Asia and Africa are increasingly migrating to Western countries, bringing with them names which have not been seen before in said countries. Modern immigrants are less likely than ever to change their names upon arrival, and more likely to give their kids traditional names from their native cultures. However, the name diversification trend seems to be a trend primarily found among the natives of Western countries. Some names aren't really being invented, but the spelling is being changed to be novel or unique. In some statistics, this leads to the names being registered as separate. Now, some names like Nathaniel and Nathaniel, or Catherine and Catherine, are spelled differently by accident, or because they were spelled differently in separate cultures, or reason along those lines, but in our world of 99% literacy, these changes are primarily intentional. One example is the common trend of replacing the letter Y in a name at the end with Lee, L-E-I-G-H, Ashley, Carly, and Emily. However, other names are genuinely being invented. In 2017, in fact, around a thousand names were reported to have been invented in the US, and as we've mentioned, this has been the case for some time. Names predicted to be popular in 2020 include Micah, Paisley, Tegan, Amina, Nova, Aura, Alva, Acacius, Ada, and Cash. I don't know anyone personally with these names, but in 20 years I might know several people with them. This, I and researchers believe, reflects a very important change in culture, specifically a move towards greater individualism. In the past, names showed adherence to a culture and society and its values and traditions. 
Names which we think of as being traditional have their origins in Christianity, in the Greco-Roman world or Celtic, Germanic, and Slavic worlds, as occupations which moved from being surnames to given names, the names of great figures of a culture or names which were simply common in a culture. In America, following the influx of Irish immigrants, names like Sean, the Irish version of John, along with names like Colleen and Shane became commonplace. These names were a way of retaining a piece of a family's Irish heritage while still giving them a socially acceptable Christian name. Naming your son George after George Washington or Thomas after Jefferson was a way of displaying American pride. Naming your daughter Mary or your son Joshua was a way of showing that you were good Christians. Naming a son Alexander or Mark tied him to the Greco-Roman world. Many names invented in modern times have not drifted too far from this past. As our ancestors were named after legends and mythical characters, some names are brought back or created by popular culture, and people are named after characters in books, movies, music, and TV shows. In recent decades, however, parents have been increasingly and intentionally choosing names which, in effect, cause their kids to stand out more. This is no doubt encouraged by celebrities who have led the charge on this trend. Kanye West's children are named North, Saint, Chicago, and Palm. The art of giving a child a unique name is to find a name which is daring enough to stand out and be admired, but not so strange that people find it a bit odd and it ends up harming the perspective of a person. Something like Luna may be a pretty name for a girl. Latin for the moon, it is also relatively uncommon, and therefore it might be ideal. However, if your child is named something like Darth Vader, Honda Civic, or Squirrel, they'll deal with mockery for their entire lives, and so name diversification occurs at a relatively fast but stable rate. This is a very interesting trend. For centuries, name creation was relatively rare and wasn't really considered when people were choosing names. The idea of inventing a name for a child would have been seen as silly or even conceited as recently as the 1950s. At this time, a smaller number of names were present in society, and often nicknames were used to differentiate people of the same name when necessary. Whether or not this is a good thing, I suppose, depends on how one sees individualism and the importance of adhering to a greater culture. Should a child's name be one which causes them to stand out and help give them a unique identity, or should it reflect that they are a part of something larger than themselves and adhere to the values of whatever group of which they are a part? Many people, and in fact many cultures, disagree. Either way, as this trend continues, the meanings attached to specific names become even more specific, as there are fewer and fewer examples of people who have them. Consider that society assigns certain personality traits, behaviors, attitudes, and even appearances to a certain name. It may be that, roughly, again, not perfectly, certain names may be more common among people with certain personality traits. It could be that certain types of parents prefer certain types of names, and have kids who turn out to be like those parents, and thus create and embody, to a degree, the stereotypes of that name. Consider, basketball fan parents across the country simultaneously decide to name their sons LeBron, after, of course, LeBron James. Like their parents, many of those children grow up to love basketball, and some even make it into the NBA. LeBron becomes the name, perhaps not even of just ballers, but athletic males in general. Would that be coincidence? I think not. As our style of clothing reflects our personalities to a limited degree, so too do the names we give our children reflect what we would like to see in them. Perhaps, therefore, it becomes a sign of a larger family attitude or character trait. Can you tell a little bit about a person's family based on their given name? I'm not sure how much data there is on this, but my hypothesis would be that there is a slight but positive correlation between certain character traits and certain names. Because of this, parents who at least partially realize this will realize that the name they give their child will reflect more heavily on him or her than in the past, and may feel more pressured to choose an appropriate and amiable name. A British survey 
undertaken by Mumsnet showed that one in five parents in Britain regretted the name they chose for their child. And what were the main reasons for this, you might ask? Because, as 25% of parents felt, the name was too common. Followed in second place at 21% by, the name just doesn't feel right. This survey kind of reinforces what we've just discussed. Adding on to this furthermore, people are changing their names at record levels as well. Likely because, again, names are becoming more personal. So let's go back to the names we mentioned before, like Kyle and Karen. The joke about the name Kyle, as I said, is that it refers to a teenager or thereabouts who is lying in his bed, blasting Sum 41, angry at the world because it doesn't understand him and because the local store is out of his favorite flavor of energy drink and punching the occasional hole in his drywall. This sort of thing. Not trying to pick on the Kyles of the world here, I'm just trying to dissect an internet meme. I've known several Kyles who are not like this at all, but I have known some who were. One thing which interested me though when I was thinking about this was that every Kyle I've ever known in my life has been around my age or younger. I was born in 97 by the way. Indeed, though the name Kyle and the female equivalent Kylie is Celtic from a region in Scotland, the name seems to have only become frequently used recently. It seems to have peaked in America in 1990 and declined in the 2010s. Accordingly, most Kyles alive today were born between 1980 and 2005, making them, in 2020, mostly the ages of 40 to 15. It's not surprising, therefore, that as a name popular among people under the age of 40, i.e. Millennials and Generation Z, it became a stereotype for this sort of angsty teenage edgelord. With a name like Karen, we see the same thing. Looking at the name here, we find it being used most commonly between 1945 and 1975, i.e. among baby boomers and Generation X, people currently aged 75 to 45. In the year 2000, only around 2,000 baby girls were named Karen in the US, compared to the peak in 1957, which saw 40,000 girls with this name. So again, no, not all Karens are the type of people who freak out and blame cashiers for not getting the discount on a sale which ended a month ago, but this behavior is stereotypically attributed to soccer mom type women above the age of 30 or so. And indeed, Karen is a name which is most common among women above the age of 30. So if a stereotype were to be developed about that group, the name Karen makes perfect sense. Looking at a name like Elizabeth, is there a stereotype you can think of for girls named Elizabeth? I couldn't really think of one. And if we look at this chart on BehindTheName.com, it shows that, despite some ups and downs, Elizabeth has been a pretty stagnant name through history, not really unique to any generation or subculture. This brings us to decline in name frequency, a very related concept. Decline in name frequency is partially owed to the fact that most names are becoming less common, but it's also clear that the decline is a case in which younger generations are avoiding giving children names which seem old-fashioned, like Beth, Tina, and Gary, which were all common in the past but have become much less popular among parents in recent decades. Age is far from the only thing which leads to a name becoming avoided or more frequently used. Association with prominent figures who bear the name can have a major effect on the frequency of the name. In Ireland, the name Oliver is avoided to this day because of its association with the hated Lord Protector, Oliver Cromwell, who died as long ago as 1658. The name Adolf plummeted in German-speaking countries after 1945, despite having been popular before it. Another area where this is seen is among monarchs, as we discussed in previous videos. Names of monarchs tend to be repeated if a bearer of the name is well admired, like the ten Constantines who followed the first Constantine the Great. Likewise, they are avoided if the monarch was hated, like with the first and only King John of England. Even if parents just happen to like a name and don't connect it to a hated figure, the likelihood that it could be associated with that figure throughout a child's life would cause problems, and most parents make the change to prevent their children from being ostracized, especially in youth. We even see new trends among surnames as well. In recent years, a little over 20% of American women kept their maiden names after being married, and a further 10% chose a hyphenated or double name, where the two last names are combined, such as Jackson Smith.
Names will likely continue to change and go through phases and cycles as they always have. Our modern naming system, including surnames, is, in fact, fairly modern, developing mostly in the late modern era. Prior to this, people were known mostly by their first name and a description or epithet, like Eric the Red, John the Smith, or Margaret the Baker. These epithets only later became surnames. It will be fascinating to see where names go in the future. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, I invite you to come check out the rest of Fire of Learning and to subscribe to see more content like this in the future. Be sure to let me know, by the way, what you think about these trends in the comments section below. To help with the cost of production of Nation on Patreon would be a big help. A special thanks to our current patrons listed here. We are also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, so come check us out there too. Thank you for watching.